Well, if you were with us last week, we said that the book of Ruth is the ultimate hallmark Christmas movie in the Bible. And when we left the story, we had just introduced the situation. A young foreign woman, a widow, lands in her widowed mother-in-law's town, having made a commitment to care for her and to seek a future in a new land. So we see that things are in desperate shape, and yet we know that in a hallmarky kind of way, something is going to happen. New love, new life, new hope. And in a Hallmark movie, that is always in the form of a connection that's made. Now, in the business, they call this a meet cute, you know, where the couple kind of gets together in this cute way, and, and oftentimes they're at odds with one another or something happens to bring them together. If the first part of the movie is all about introducing us to these people, this is about the connection. We want to get to the point where we're rooting for these lovebirds to get together. And the story of Ruth follows this pattern, but there is more at stake here than just a potential romance. See, this isn't just about happily ever after for this couple. It's about the survival of a family, a family that will become the family of a king. That's why the story is here in the Bible in the first place. And so the characters are driven by more than just self-interest. They are in it for a larger purpose, a purpose that goes beyond even the family that's being formed. Now, we've already talked about Ruth's hope. And remember what we said about hope, that it's risk plus commitment. She's taken a risk. She's committed to care for her mother-in-law. She takes on a role that she doesn't have to. She could have easily gone back to Moab, but Ruth will offer hope in the midst of a seemingly hopeless situation. She'll have faith when all the signs point to there being a dead end. Now, we're already impressed with Ruth. Aren't you impressed with her? I mean, you learned about her a little bit last week. Here's this young woman who's dedicated to caring for her mother-in-law. She's demonstrated more faith in Israel's God than many of the Israelites around her. But she needs help. She needs a partner to bring this hope to reality. Enter Boaz. We're introduced to him here in chapter 2. And if a good Hallmark movie needs a good Mr. Right, well, Boaz, Boaz is the perfect candidate. And we get some clues about his goodness, his Mr. Rightness here in chapter one. Right there in verse one, we learn that Boaz is a kinsman on Naomi's husband's side. He's a relative of Elimelech, which means that he is a perfect candidate to partner with this family for rescue. After all, he's one of the family, and as such, he can be the link to restoring Elimelech's line and property, which is the reason why the narrator tells us twice in a couple of sentences that, oh, by the way, he's from the family of Elimelech. Don't forget that. He's going to be important here. But even more important, we read that he is a man of standing, as the NIV version puts it, or a prominent rich man, as the New Revised Standard Version calls him. These are translations of an important phrase in Hebrew. Here's your Hebrew lesson for the week. Here it comes. He is a man of Gibor Chayil. Can you say that? Gibor Chayil. You got to get back there. Again, the English phrasing makes it seem like he's just a wealthy dude. But the Hebrew words imply something more like might or strength, something one would ascribe to a warrior or a hero a person of worth. This is a phrase then that's more about the wealth of his character than the wealth of his bank account. Yes, we will see, not only is Boaz a relative, but he's a relatively well-off relative. And we'll see even more that he has a wealth of character. He may have been a veteran of the wars of the book of Judges, but here he's going to defend the honor of the defenseless. Indeed, as the names in the book of Ruth tend to mean something, Boaz, the name means something like, in him there is might. He is a man who's going to use that might to do the next right thing every time in this story. Even though no one would expect him to do so, especially given the history of the book of Judges. 
And even though he has no obligation to do so, he does the next right thing. Now we've already been introduced to Ruth. Now we're introduced to the character of the one who has power. She's defenseless, vulnerable. He is powerful and mighty. What's going to happen here? He's going to use his power on behalf of the powerless. Boaz may have been a warrior, but we learn now that he is a man who fights for peace. Not peace as the absence of conflict, but peace as the restoration of order and care for all. That's what the Hebrew word shalom actually means, peace. It's not just the absence of conflict. It's about wholeness, restoration. Boaz then is going to teach us about what it means to be people of peace on the Sunday where we light the candle of peace. So what do we learn about people of peace from Boaz? First of all, we learn that people of peace are godly. The chapter opens with Ruth's plan to go gleaning in the fields. Gleaning was actually a practice commanded by God in the law of Moses, the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. It was a practice that was designed to to, uh, uphold the dignity of the poor. So rather than simply giving handouts, the farmers of Israel were instructed to leave some of their produce in the field for the poor to gather up after the harvest had gone by. Now, rich people don't generally get rich by leaving profits unclaimed, do they? If you left a lot of produce in the field that could have been picked up, that would cut into your profits. Instead, you'd scour every last stalk of grain. You'd also run off the poor who tried to grab any of the scraps, but not Boaz. He's a faithful Israelite. Ruth, a foreign woman, attempts to glean in Boaz's field. I love how the text puts it, as it happened. Just so happened that she showed up here. God's not acting big in this story, but in the background, you kind of get this sense that he's making the connection. We know it's not a coincidence because Ruth has put her faith in Israel's God and has led to a field owned by a man who has that same kind of faith. Ruth goes out in hopes of finding favor with a generous farmer or at least a tolerant one. Finding favor is another way of talking about grace. Boaz is going to offer grace in a time when it has been in short supply. Boaz is greeting to his workers. You notice when he goes out and he comes to his workers, he gives them a divine blessing. The Lord be with you. And the reapers respond, the Lord bless you. Boaz knows his God and he treats his employees with respect. Godliness is a way of describing a life that is always oriented toward pleasing God above all else. Hey, if he wants to preach, that's cool. You know, everybody else is, everybody else is kind of losing it up here. It can't be any worse. Okay, so whether it be profits or power, rights or returns, he wants to please God above all else. In a godless time, godly people stand out because they run against the grain. Boaz, in in other words, is not like the other men in the book of Judges. He looks to find favor with God. The world needs fewer culture warriors, I think, and more persons of peace. Godly people who seek God's favor. People who obey God even when it's costly. People who will treat others with respect. People who will do the next thing right thing. And that means that people of peace also value people. Boaz clearly knows the people who work for him. He can recognize when there's a stranger among them. And he notices Ruth. He notices her working hard in the field on a hot day, and he inquires about her. Now, the the head reaper, you'll notice, the harvester, doesn't call her by name, just as she's the Moabite woman here again. Remember that Ruth is a foreigner, she's a woman, and she's poor. That's three strikes against you if you live in the Israelite world. She has no status in that culture. But Boaz notices her. He notices her work, notices her character. People of peace notice people that others do not. They see the workers in the grocery store. They see the waitstaff at the restaurant. They see the homeless on the street, the poor, the broken. They acknowledge their existence. They acknowledge their need. 
Now, Boaz could have easily ignored this young woman. Now, if we're playing this out in the Hallmark scenario, the way it would have happened is that that Boaz would see her across a field, this beautiful young woman bending over and picking up grain and think to himself, who's that? You know? But there's no indication in the text that there's romance at this point, right? He notices that she's new and he notices that she is working hard. Two major things. Do we notice the people around us? Do we see that new person in church? Do we see that person who's in the corner, in the shadows? The person who's toiling away? Do we notice them? Part of valuing people is also protecting and advocating for them. Boaz recognizes Ruth's vulnerability. She's a woman with no male protector. She's vulnerable to advances and exploitation by others. You notice in the text that Boaz orders his young men not to bother her, not to bother her. That has broader implications than just harassment. The fact that he tells them this three times to leave her alone, it's an indicator that she's in real danger as a single woman trying to eke out an existence. And after you've read some of the horrific stories in the book of Judges, you realize that this story could go bad in a hurry. But Boaz is a godly man. He's a person of peace. He tells Ruth to stick close to the other young women and to come and drink from the water jars that the young men have drawn. In other words, he brings her into his orbit. And he gives her the same protection that he has given to the others. In a world where vulnerable people are often exploited, persons of peace look for ways to protect them. Human trafficking, exploited labor, child abuse, racial profiling, these are just some of the ways in which people are degraded and devalued in our own day. Persons of peace challenge the systems that would exploit others and they care for the victims and the potential victims. Ruth herself recognizes that she is vulnerable and she's astonished at Boaz's peaceful protection over her. Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I'm a foreigner? Boaz's answer reveals that he does not see her nationality, her ethnicity, her poverty as something to be exploited. Rather, he sees her character as something to be honored. Boaz knows what she's done for Naomi, how Ruth left her native land and and her people to throw in with a God and a people she did not know. Remember, Bethlehem is a small town. We know about small towns, right? Word gets around. Who is this woman? Oh, she's the one who came back with Naomi. Boaz recognizes her then not as a foreigner, but as one whom God values. Look at verse 12. May the Lord reward you for your deeds and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Amen. (laughs) Ruth responds with relief. She's been comforted by this blessing and protection, made to feel safe, made to feel at peace. Boaz has spoken kindly to her. You have to wonder how often people have spoken kindly to Ruth at this point in the story. A foreigner from Moab. It's an echo of that Hebrew word hesed, which is another word that's used several times throughout the book. In fact, it's used a lot throughout the Old Testament. In chapter 1, remember Naomi offers a blessing to her daughters-in-law. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt kindly with the dead and with me. That word hesed is often translated as loving kindness or steadfast love. It's not the happy sentimental kind of love that is portrayed in the movies, but love that invests in the life of the other. Love that is grounded in unwavering loyalty and faithfulness. It's the kind of loving kindness that God demonstrates to us. Further revealing that Ruth sees God's kindness being offered to her through Boaz. Remember Naomi's blessing on her two mothers-in-law, daughters-in-law. May he deal kindly with you. That kindliness has now come in the form of Boaz, 
a godly man who sees in Ruth a godly woman, a woman of Hesed, a woman of Chayil, as he will later call her. See, Boaz recognizes Ruth's worth, her character, and he's going to do all in her, his power to protect her. People of peace recognize the worth in every person. They do all in their power to protect them, to meet their needs, to bless them in any way that they can. Part of that blessing means that people of peace are also generous. As if to underscore his kindness, Boaz invites Ruth to join the other workers at the noon meal. And not only does he provide for her, he provides in abundance, giving her more food than she can eat, knowing full well that she's going to take a doggy bag back to Naomi and make sure that she gets fed as well. And then he goes even further. He tells his workers to leave behind handfuls of grain for her to glean so that she will not just be left with meager returns. Indeed, when she beats out the barley she had gleaned by the end of the day, it was an ephah. Now, I don't know if you're up on your Israelite measurements, but an ephah is two-thirds of a bushel or about 30 to 50 pounds worth of grain, the same as a month's worth of grain that was normally allotted to male workers. That abundance is testimony both to Ruth's hard work and to Boaz's generosity. People of peace are not stingy in helping others. They offer more than what is expected. They don't keep people at arm's length, nor do they merely hand out checks. They offer hospitality to the poor and those on the margins, inviting them to join in the abundance. And in doing so then, people of peace also restore hope. Now the scene shifts back to Naomi. Ruth comes home with this abundance of grain and Naomi is shocked. Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And when Naomi hears that it's Boaz, you notice how her countenance changes. Now, remember when we last left her, what was she calling herself? Mara, bitterness. Lord has taken everything from me. I've come back to Bethlehem empty. She'd given up on God. But when she heard that it was Boaz, a kinsman who had shown kindness to her foreign daughter-in-law, her first thought was to offer this blessing. Verse 20, blessed be he by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, this man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. Now the syntax is a little bit unclear here. Whose kindness or hesed is Naomi acknowledging? The Lord's or that of Boaz? Well, I think the writer makes the statement intentionally ambiguous because the answer is that God has shown his kindness, his hesed, his steadfast love to Naomi and Ruth through Boaz. For Naomi... This is a step back toward faith and hope. She thought she had returned to Bethlehem empty. She had Ruth. Ruth did not return empty from gleaning. She brought back food, but moreover, she brought back hope. The kind, godly, and generous actions of Boaz had not only restored Ruth's dignity as a foreigner, he'd also restored Naomi's hope. I love this because I think it's a reminder to us that we never know how far reaching our acts of kindness might be, how far they might go. Simple kindness can have massive implications. We'll see that truth spin out here in the rest of the story. Ruth will continue to glean through the barley and the wheat harvests but we know that this is just the beginning of the restoration of this potentially royal family. All because Boaz simply did the next right thing. It's hard to imagine a better Mr. Right for this story than Boaz. And yet, when we remember where this story is going, we recognize that Boaz is merely hinting at the character of his greatest royal descendant, and that's Jesus himself. Jesus demonstrated true godliness in human form, living a life 
that reflected the fullness of God. He sees people that others have ignored or exploited and he treats them as people made in God's image. He focuses more on their character than their ethnicity, their wealth, or their status. He values people that the world does not. He sees everyone as valuable and precious. He's generous with his time and with his touch, healing people and meeting their needs wherever they are. And he restores hope when hope seems to be in short supply. He gives ultimate hope to humanity through his death and resurrection, slaving, saving us from slavery to sin and death. Who is Jesus? The Prince of Peace. One of Boaz's royal descendants. And he sends his disciples out to be people of peace. If you go to Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the 70. And he says, as you go, when you reach a house, what's the first thing they're supposed to do? Do you know? Proclaim peace to this house. To offer peace first. To protect and provide for people. To rely on the kindness of strangers. To offer peace in a way that changes people's stories. Boaz's role as a person of peace changes this story. Remember we said in the Hallmark formula, there's a miracle that changes everything. What's the miracle here? Simple kindness. To be a person of peace. We can change another person's story in the very same way. On this Sunday when we light the candle of peace, may it not just be a symbol for us, but may it be a call to us to be story changers, to be Ms. and Mr. Wright for the world in the model of Boaz, in the model of Jesus. Amen. And amen.